Happy Sunday, beautiful community. We're not just going to react to Peter Zion's video on Navalny, which is what a few of you have asked me to do. We're actually going to have a substantive conversation about Navalny that will be a little more in depth than what most of you would have encountered in the world so far. And we'll end with a very short, searing piece about the meaning of Navalny's death by Russian political philosopher Greg Uden. It's by far the best thing anybody has said about the death of Navalny. So settle in. I imagine you might be together with me for half an hour or so if you want to um, sit through everything we will do. I do not do debunk videos. They are unconstructive. You know, Vlad destroys Bob Smith. You know, that's not a very good proposition because even if I do destroy Bob Smith, who said the wrong thing about, I don't know, fascism versus authoritarianism, how is that going to help Becky, who is 72, who lives in Vancouver and is desperately worried about the state of the world's politics? You know, so we're going to elevate ourselves. We're going to educate ourselves and we're going to explore, right? We're not going to do any demolition jobs. But we're going to start with Peter Zion's short video to which you've asked me to respond. And I will model a response that takes us to the core of what it means to process things in our broken informational environment as well. So we'll do a bit of that as well as focus on the Vanley. I have just watched all of Peter's three minute video and a minute and a half in he's finished giving the basic details so that's when we will plug ourselves in. Now before anyone gets to crying about this couple things to keep in mind number one Russia's not a democracy it hasn't really been a democracy in over 20 years so uh, even if Nalbany was allowed to continue to be part of the political conversation in Russia it's not like he has any chance of changing policy he was more of a personal annoyance to Putin and nothing more. Um, there are other people within the ruling party who have decided to run for presidency against Putin on a very nationalist ticket, but just be opposed to the war and they're not being allowed to participate either. So it really doesn't matter. It's something that pro-democracy activists in the West get really excited about because he's a name that more people know, but he was never going to have any influence. Never going to have any influence. So something about the significance of Navalny. Uh, second, careful what you wish for. Uh, Nalvani may have been a nicer guy than Putin, because, you know, low bar, but he was just as nationalist. And his biggest criticism of the Ukraine war wasn't that it was happening, but it just wasn't being prosecuted very well. Okay, so uh, there's a claim there, which is obviously false, that Navalny supported the war. And there's a claim there about Navalny's nationalism. I think a lot of you are interested to discuss this more. Uh, people forget that the, the strong predilection among Russians is to continue the war. They just don't want to be part of it personally. Uh, the idea that Russia needs to expand its borders in order to survive is not one that is particularly debated in Russia. It's a generally been their security policy for 400 years, that as long as your external borders are flat and open, you're not safe. So you have to go through Ukraine to get to Romania, Poland and the rest. Okay, so Peter is sellotaping his um, theory of the causes of war into our Navalny conversation here. Now, of course, that's bad for Romania and Poland and the rest, but uh, the Russians are not misreading the map. And unfortunately, that gets wrapped up in the political discussion so that folks like Navalny appear more important than they really are. So, I mean, I feel bad for the guy and his family, but we were probably always going to get here. So we'll talk about Navalny and nationalism, Navalny and Ukraine and the war, Navalny and his significance. But let's start with not so much talking about what Peter did in the forest, but talk about what Peter did in the forest with a view to understanding how to conduct ourselves constructively and safely in our informational environment, which is a challenging one and a fluctuating one, and in many ways, an unfiltered and messy one, you know. Uh, we have an internet that is conducive to the multiplication of various kinds of 
mental world bubbles and fact world bubbles and uh, this is hard and that's why sort of unconstructively telling people off or eviscerating them is not actually helpful so I want to minimize write down a tendency to have breakfast table conversations which go somewhat like this well honey what's the news in the papers well it's the climate crisis it's ukraine and geopolitical strategist peter zion has gone to the forest and said the wrong thing honey he did what he said the wrong thing in the forest he, he, let's call the police well he's already been charged with, with not saying the right thing in the foggy forest um well honey what is the world coming to that is a very common response um and i'm mocking it because it's worth dwelling on why um it's dangerous to get too much ahead with it and youtube encourages us into that response you know um and we've got to be gentle and slow so let's do this responsibly now first of all there are such things as slips i'm not a peter zion uh connoisseur so i have limited exposure to him and i have his book i've read his latest book i've had read only very small parts of it but peter makes slips um he makes slips that are casual there is a video on this channel uh analyzing peter's analysis of the causation of uh, putin's invasion of ukraine it's from a few months ago just google vlad vexler peter zion but i have seen peter on the joe rogan podcast confuse chernomirdin with chernenko um i have heard peter say that gorbachev was in the kgb together with andropov and i have a very high tolerance of for slips and i don't like picking on those um so i want to actually go as far as saying that we've got to consider that you could pick up your damn smartphone walk into the forest for th for three minutes and turn it on and kind of misspeak all the way through because you might have a family challenge you might have um uh you might need to go and pee you you might have a, a stressful meeting coming up and you could just misspeak for the for, for the full video that is possible the challenge we've got is that there is no editor to come in and correct you if peter submitted this video into any serious publication it wouldn't be published because it contains errors and they would need to be corrected but you know we've got to be gentle about this business of just um sometimes floating away with what you're with what you're talking about um and even maybe making a a, a sort of rash judgment about um what to touch upon what not to touch upon in your sort of daily or bi-weekly um chat into your smartphone so we've got to be very gentle on 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 these slips and you've got to be gentle on also zion's pronunciation of navalny it's completely irrelevant that he can't pronounce the guy's name there's lots of people who can't pronounce things lots of people living with neurodiversities of various kinds so all of this is unimportant so we're left with then two things a, a sense of ethics as exploitation and a sense of ethics as responsibility ethics as exploitation means you are doing manipulation and in informational environment to promote a cause or to promote yourself in this particular video do i see this no i just don't i don't see any grift here i don't see any attempt to um, manipulate out a particular narrative to get a certain result there's a lot of stuff said about navalny on different sides of the discourse that are if you like instrumental things to say that are not driven by um just expressing an opinion because you think it's true um i see no evidence of manipulation of any kind in this video and i don't see any evidence of grift so i want to put aside the ethics as exploitation problem so we're left with ethics as a responsibility and here we're back to this situation what should you what should you not speak on um in this environment where Google might not want you to say certain things, but it's not going to come in and, you know, mediate 
um, and uh, filter the vast majority of your speech is just going to come out as you get it out there into the world. And here, I think zinging Peter is a secondary thing because primary has got to be the fact that we're out in this informational environment. And if Peter wants to do a four hour lecture of Navalny, even if he doesn't know much about him, nobody's going to stop him. But I think that our conversation about what's wrong with that shouldn't start with Peter's gone to the forest for four hours and he's done a lecture. It should start with the shape of our informational environment and how that relates to democracy. And yes, our information environment is a bit like a soccer game without a coach and without a referee. And somebody who is a, a striker can suddenly put themselves in goal, even though that's not their position, they don't know how to work there. And nobody's going to stop them, right? Unless they do something transgressive that Google doesn't like them to say, but that's not going to happen unless they talk about certain um, health policies or certain demonstrative matters of fact or they engage in certain promotions of violence or if they're just arbitrarily arbitrarily picked up by the you know um algorithm for saying the wrong thing so i'm going to bring this right down and i think that is the correct way to respond in the informational environment this is a a fluid game without rules and just massively overloading the responsibility of every content creator to get it right every single time and only doing that misses the point of the fact that we have these bizarre unregulated public squares owned by essentially potato chip companies potato chip companies as far as legitimacy is concerned right i mean there are certain things for instance that we can or can't say um on certain platforms but the legitimacy of Facebook, Meta, or YouTube to regulate this is no greater than the legitimacy of my local kebab shop to do it. It's the same thing. It's just a private business that has no democratic credentials filtering our public squares. That's the focus. It's not that Peter went to the forest and it was beautifully foggy and he spoke a little bit too much about something he may have reflected upon and, and you know, not, not gone into. Okay. Substance now. Mm. The violin and the war. The violin in Ukraine. The Valne said all kinds of things about Ukraine in the early tens which Ukrainians may not like and especially will not like today things like I don't see a massive difference between Ukrainians and Russians to be honest they're fairly close nations um, now you see don't get carried away by the politically correct um, fake anti-colonialism that says that Russians and Ukrainians are completely unlike. I'm sorry, they, they're not unlike. They have many similarities. And as somebody who is substantively not Russian, I can see big similarities there um, uh, as an outsider, but with a foot in. Nevertheless, um, Russia and Ukraine are different places. And when Navalny in 2014 says that Russia and Ukraine are the same uh, in many ways. It doesn't see vast differences. Um, it ain't great. Not because it offends Ukrainians, that's true too, but because it somewhat plays into a pathology of um, boundarylessness that Russia suffers from and that has just been catastrophically expressed in the annexation of Crimea. Yeah? So it's kind of statements like that. But on policy, uh, Navalny was quite clear. He immediately said that the annexation of Crimea in 2014 is wrong, unacceptable, and illegal. So illegal and wrong. And he was clear about that, and he remained clear about that. 
this is regularly for manipulative reasons misrepresented in the informational environment and the Kremlin has also tried to itself make a contribution to the misrepresentation of this fact because it's interested in casting Navalny as an imperialist. Um, now, at the time of Navalny saying the annexation of Crimea is illegal and unacceptable, he did a video with Alexei Venediktov on a platform called Echo Moscow, where Venediktov pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed Navalny and said, you know, which is it? Whose is Crimea? And Navalny kept coming back. It's Crimea uh, belongs to Crimeans. He didn't want to say it's Ukrainian or Russian. It belongs to Crimeans. Should we give it back? Should we give it back? Should be given back. And then Navalny came back with, it's not a thing you pass back and forth. It's not a... Um, sandwich and so his position remained um his public position remained and obviously privately he thought that the annexation of Crimea was a complete catastrophe um because you just can't do that um but he, his public position was illegal and acceptable but i mean Ukrainians have to be realistic, they're not going to get it back anytime soon, and giving it back is hard, and I have some political reasons to mince my words about this, because I'm trying to mobilize a domestic Russian audience, blah, blah, blah. And he never clarified or corrected himself into a position that says Crimea is simply Ukrainian, we've got to give it back ASAP, until... Um, quite a few months into the war when he released a 15-point manifesto where he said there is no negotiation, there is no ifs or buts. Ukraine has 9091 borders and there is nothing more to discuss here. Ukraine is in its 1991 borders and there are no ifs, no buts, no returning this but not straight away, blah, blah, blah. No. Um, so there's no negotiation there. So he developed a very clear position um, about this uh, quite a while into the war. So that's Navalny on Crimea. Navalny on the war. Navalny thought it was a criminal war and a really dreadful, cat catastrophic war, not just for Ukraine, but for Russia from the beginning. And his organization probably about six times a day, said it was a criminal and illegal and immoral war. Um, and indeed, they've been calling it a genocidal war, I think, as well. And they started doing this from hour one of the war. So, um, Peter's point that Navalny supported the war is, and you see, I'm not comfortable to use words like disinformation, certainly not misinformation, Peter's not trying to do anything wrong here. Um, I don't like the word disinformation. It, sound, it, it sounds too definitive. It's just BS in the forest, okay? Um, so, yes, it's BS in the forest, and it's flagrantly, flagrantly false. Um, it's not as obviously factually false as saying that Navalny is seven foot tall, because he's about, whatever, six foot three. Um, but he, uh, it's, it's, it's not far from being just a glaring, more or less a glaring factual um, misstatement. And um, I have nothing to say about whether Peter just doesn't know enough or whether he just was fuzzy in this moment when he was speaking. So let's move a bit to nationalism. Navalny and nationalism. I don't think that this is as factually clear because you can just look at Navalny's statements and trace what he said about Ukraine, what he said about the war. To what degree was he a nationalist and how much less of a nationalist is he than Putin is a question with objective answers, but they're less factual. They require a little bit more interpretation. Obviously, saying that Navalny is a nationalist of anything like the Putin kind is... Uh, in the realm of absurdity. 
Let's retrace this a little bit. Earlier on in his political career, more like 10, 15 years ago, Navalny engaged with hard right factions and engaged in a certain amount of rhetoric that is has a ring of xenophobia or, or certain exclusionary hard right um, um, quality and engaged also in some irresponsible remarks about sort of Russians and ethnic Russians in, in, in Russia, um, which are unacceptable because of the video we've just made on the main channel uh, about the possible breakup of Russia and how many you know, ethnic, ethnic, ethnically diverse groups there are there. What the hell was he doing? Because that rhetoric has been pretty absent from his discourse in, in recent years. So this was less sincere by Navalny than it was an enterprise, at uh, uh, um, an enterprise of political mobilization. He was impressed um, by some of the things going on in Ukraine, as he was also impressed by the Maidan. And he felt that one of the lessons is about coalition formation and he realized that part of that is working with hard right groups uh, among many other types of groups and that in Russia in particular you couldn't achieve change without trying to build coalitions like this and if you abstract away very far out the idea is right Right, that you've got to get on board not just a sliver of people who are liberally democratically motivated, but you've get, got to get on board people who are differently minded, people who are indeed associated with the security state or associated with the army and who have nationalist views. My solution to this for the Russian opposition, if they wanted advice, which I, I don't, I would never give, um, um, or certainly never given on an ongoing basis, because um, it's not really my country. Um, but my advice would be to lean heavily into patriotism, but not nationalism. And I might say on another occasion what that means. That means actually saying things like, we care about the Russian army, and we're going to make pro-Russian army content by pointing out what evil the Russian army is committing in Ukraine. And we're going to say, look what you've done with our army that's supposed to be great. Look at what the Messianic thieves in the Kremlin have done with this great institution, right? They did this stuff in the war. And then you'd start correcting some narratives about the Second World War too that are misrepresentative. You'd start leveraging, for example, the war away from the regime and toward people. Um, you'd have a more bottom-up mythology of the Second World War. But you could still center the institution of the army um, and say, look at the evil the army has been forced into in Ukraine by this bad regime, blah, 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 blah. So you'd send the patriotism. But Navalny was trying to feel this through. It didn't work. Um, some of the nationalist allies were disbanded because the regime was keen to sort them out because it saw them as a, as a, as a threat and a nuisance. Um, and this whole enterprise was part of his political maturation. What I would say is that my analysis is that this was, this was uh, less organic and so what, what, then it was sort of um, tactical. And one of the problems Navalny has now, as Masha Gessen um, has rightly pointed out, is that he, 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 he's... Um, I'm speaking, to, uh, speaking about him in the present tense, but he's got a reputation for sort of deploying different techniques and tactics um, in a way that makes people wonder, well, is his current shtick just another tactic, right? Is his shtick that he seems to be a sort of 
liberal democrat bog standard liberal democrat in many ways indeed is that a shtick too and is he going to give us something else seven years from now um but roughly speaking i think that that's that's the the story to say about his nationalism so no there's no way this can be compared to putin's uh, uh grotesque imperialist mania um and therefore yes it's bears in the forest on the on the uh, nationalist point. Um, and I I'm going to give you a very important tip here, I think, that's really constructive. Don't imagine Navalny as somebody you're going to be voting for potentially in your country and judge him on that. That's not what was ever offered to us. What's offered to us is that this is guy under very extreme conditions trying to politicize the situation in this tyrannical regime. Right? And do we think that he's doing a bad job, a good job, and is the kind of job he's doing in our interests? What are our interests? Well, our interests are security on the European space, Ukraine being safe, that kind of thing. So that's how to judge. You see, if you forced me into um, a conversation, you know, how would I as a, as a British citizen feel about voting for somebody as, uh, like Navalny? I would say I don't like it. Why do I not like it? Is it because he's terribly nationalist or is it because he has, um, uh, you know, uh, been justifying dreadful things the Putin regime has been? No, I, I would be very, very disinclined to vote for Navalny because he is to such a great extent a generic Western centrist. I, I would be very uncomfortable to vote for Navalny because the crisis of democracy we're experiencing in the West has been generated by a politics that preceded it and now can't fathom what parts of what it did, what that politics did, may have actually triggered the kind of backlash we're experiencing. So he he's not sort of stuck in himself. He's always open, Navalny. He could always sort of entertain the idea of why Trump voter votes for Trump or why Trump voter doesn't accept an election result in the United States. So he isn't going to be as resistant to this as somebody like Hillary Clinton would be. But he's nevertheless... Um, going to run a fairly standard centrist and he might tilt to the left to the right depending on which time of the of his career you, you pick him but he's going to give us a kind of a generic rather thoughtless Fukuyamian centrism that misses some important historical questions right and so um, as I said in the main channel video the biggest objection to Navalny was the lack of an offer of a concrete alternative for Russia, except just generic reconstructions of Western centrist politics. Um, and Russia needed something a bit more concrete and, and, and realistic on the table from him, I think, than that. Um, not that that's a devastating criticism because of the extraordinary amount that he's done. So that's a little bit on 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 Navalny. Yes, there's yakiness there in the past with his um, um, exploitations of nationalism. Um, but if there's a real fault with Navalny, <laughs> it's the Fukuyama fault. It's not the Putinite fault or the Ghastly nationalist fault. Now, the third thing Peter put on the table there is Navalny's lack of significance. Well, Navalny before the war, and you've got to be very careful with polls, but Navalny was polling at something like significant double-digit support across Russia. Maybe one in five people may have said, yeah, I kind of fancy him. In an atmosphere where everything was done to poison his reputation. So, um, I, this is somebody who also scared the hell out of the regime by doing surprisingly well in the Moscow mayoral election just over 10 years ago. Um, and this is somebody who in the future may mobilize millions of people when Russians feel there is a possibility to act. So the idea that we're undermining the significance, we're, we're, we're overstating the significance of Navalny is just not, is just not realistic. Um, and in fact, I won't even explain why that's so, because I think all of our conversations about Navalny cumulatively are in fact an answer to that point. Now, there is also something else to be said here, and that is that, I'm sorry, but... Uh, uh, as somebody who mostly experiences their political identity as a West European, and as 
British citizen. Navalny is a European politician. And the messianically deranged tyrant killed him. The messianically deranged tyrant has been bombarding Ukraine for two years. And the messianically deranged tyrant has killed the European politician. And that's disgraceful. Um, and that is the height of political irresponsibility. So there is also somewhat weakly perhaps, but still an us here. We don't have to be Russians to be exercised about this. I think we've got to acknowledge that too. So I think there is significance there. Now, let's turn to Greg's, Greg Eugen's piece. Oh, um, final remark, the justifications for the war. Peter has talked about the justification for the war. And I, I don't want to touch on this, but Peter ties it somewhat to his point about Navalny, that everybody buys into a story about how Russia has to um, secure itself. Um, I'll say two things briefly and just otherwise externalize you, refer you to the Peter Zion video from about a year ago in this chat channel. I am going to be blunt here. I know much more than Peter Zion does about the Kremlin, about Russian politics. Do I recognize Peter's account of the causation of the war as being among the significant triggers for it? No. Can I think of a single Russia expert who does? Not one. Um, not one. Um, that doesn't prove Peter wrong. Um, we could all be wrong, he could be right. But this is just a sociological fact worth putting on the table. Let me put a philosophical fact down on the table. For Peter, philosophical point down on the table. If Peter is right, his story would need to run through the psychology of the seven most important people in that regime. Um, that's to say, Peter could not be right if his story about the causation of the war didn't run through the minds of the Kovalchuk brothers and Patrushev and Putin to some degree. It wasn't a sort of a top three thing. And it just isn't. I mean, it just isn't, um, you know, his, Peter's demography mediated national security account of the causation of the war is actually less in the minds of the people who started the war than John Mearsheimer's account. John Mearsheimer's account isn't primary, which is why John Mearsheimer is wrong. And we'll have a video about that on the main channel soon, I think. Um, but out of the two, I think, um, Mearsheimers might might have a, a bigger sliver in their minds than Peter's justification. So that's a philosophical and a sociological point here that's worth putting on the table. I don't think in itself these two points settle the argument, but they condition how it might go. Now get ready for a, a very moving statement. Um, th this is the best thing um, said so far about Navalny's death. This is addressed by Greg Uden to Russians, not to us, okay? And it is better, by far actually better than the main channel video I did. Um, but it also doing a somewhat different thing. And what's striking about it is that the level of conversation, quality of conversation that Greg reaches here with Russians is the level of conversation you and I will reach as we talk about ourselves, as we talk about the West, right? Um, but I'm a Western political philosopher talking to you about Western democracy and Russia. Greg is a Russian political philosopher talking to Russians about Navalny's death, and there's the power in this. So let's do it. All politics, in fact, is built on two human effects, fear and hope. Putin governs by maintaining fear in people. Fear has the power to mobilize. Fear of each other, of a powerful tyrant, of an insidious enemy. There is so much of this fear 
that it turns into fear of the future. When a person is truly scared, he doesn't need a real threat. He's afraid of everything. Alexei Navalny countered this with the politics of hope. Hope is a powerful remedy. She too mobilizes people, but not by knocking them into a frightened herd clinging to the shepherd, but by revealing in them brave companions who step forward together. Alexei's constant jokes about seemingly unbearable conditions are not only heroism, but also sober calculation. Having bet on hope, you must hold on to it until the end. This is your strength. It is impossible to break Navalny. He has too much hope. There was so much hope in Alexei that I am sure he would have been able to, to awaken and fill his beloved country with hope for which he was ready to give his life. This is beginning to border on kitsch, but it just about stays on the right side of it because Greg is Russian and he's addressing a Russian audience here and he's trying to mobilize them and trying to give them an account of the reality they're in that is truthful but doesn't um, doesn't leave them immobilized. But it turned out that the task is much more difficult. The world as a whole is deprived of hope today and first it'll have to be returned to the whole world. So what Greg is telling them is that Putin is a dreadful problem but it's not quintessentially a Russian problem. It's an intensification of broader patterns of problem out there in the world. And when um, Hudin's colleague Boris Kogarlitsky was arrested again recently and this time sent to jail for half a decade. The left-wing uh, uh, intellectual. And Greg was asked, why didn't Boris Kogarlitsky leave? Greg said, where do you go? This is going to come your way wherever you are. And what Greg means by that isn't just that um, Putin's ambitions go far beyond Ukraine and his imperialist project needs to be stopped because it won't stop unless it is either stopped or it runs out of capacity. Um, and it's coming your way. It's going to come to it's going to come to Europe too. It doesn't just mean that. He also means that the forces that generated the Putin problem are global forces political forces, economic forces that are drifting Western countries in a bad direction too. Right? So you've got to stop yourself drifting into a direction proximal to the kind of nightmare Putin represents and you've got to realize that the Putin nightmare is, a, is one that spreads and needs to be stopped. So he's saying to Russians, if you're Russian and you go to Berlin, yeah, you can do that and maybe that's right for you but don't think that that's a sort of a clean line you can draw and you can be free from the Putin problem it's going to come there for you not because you're Russian necessarily actually but because um, it, it's going to come it's going to come to the West that's his point of view I know that today many felt that hope had died people from various countries write to me whose fate is in no way connected with Russia. They write that their hope has died because Alexei Navalny has long surpassed the scale of his homeland and has become a symbol of hope for people all over the world. When hope dies, despair sets in. The philosopher Adorno wrote, quoting the writer Christian Grabe, only despair can save us. This sounds pompous, but it's actually entirely a rational thought. You need to reach the last depths of despair in order to lose unnecessary illusions. And then the possibility of action will finally open up. G Greg is always emphasizing and always clear about what it means. And this is my language, not his. Um, for Russians to develop an account of agency, right? If I do X, will Y follow? And if Y follows, will Z follow? And so on, right? transformation it's necessary to renounce the saving excuses it'll work out somehow it won't affect me i'll have time to bounce away after all it doesn't last forever i'll go where it's safe where it won't reach me greg says it won't pass 
it will affect you. It will definitely reach you. And despair sets in when there is no more place to hide. He's implying that today there's still that still is the case. There are places to hide. But it won't be so forever. In Russia, they like to say that it is darkest before dawn. I think this is true. We just hardly know real darkness yet. It looks like dusk is setting in. The sun has gone. Thank you very much for being with me. Lots of love and toxin.